So today um, we're going to talk about why bigger is not always better um, and in the context of culvert hydraulics and, and how that works with stream, drainage way, and those type of systems. So we're going to be looking at um, how culvert sizes affect stream mechanics, um, the twofold problem of flood volume and stream stability, and then also um, design considerations uh, you can make with your projects. So really how this kind of idea came to me was a number of different projects where I was dealing with small undersized culverts over a roadway embankment in a ephemeral drainage. We're going to try to turn that off. And um, the, the issue in terms of how is that stream or drainage way going to respond if we upsize, improve this culvert, what's going on? So a few different things to think about for your projects is um, what sort of setting are you, are you working in? Um, is this an 18 inch drainage culvert under a roadway? Um, is this an in-stream structure, right? And then if it's an in-stream structure, what is the composition of your stream, your watershed? Um, you know, there's no one size fits all with all of this stuff. So, you know, some kind of major considerations are fine bed systems, coarse bed systems. Do you have perennial flow? Is this an ephemeral, flashy um, system? And, and how are those responses um, going to affect your, your culvert improvement design um, or full-on culvert removal? So a good way to um, start thinking about this is, is the idea of a stream response potential. And this, this comes out of um, this publication right here uh, from Bledsoe, I believe, was the, the main investigator, very good um, publication, one worth checking out. But in this, we talk about you know, a fine bed river system is going to have a higher stream response potential to whatever sort of action you're doing in that. And that includes, you know, this culvert um, increase, decrease, whatever you're doing with it, because there's a greater range of flows um, that are going to affect the sediment transport in that system. You're going to see, you know, bankful discharge all the way to five year, and, and you're working with a greater variability. And so that may require a more advanced analysis or a little more thought. The inverse is a coarse bed system where that stream response potential is reduced because the range of flows that are going to affect um, how sediment or particles are mobilized is reduced. You, you may not see entrainment in a bankful discharge. It may take up to a five-year storm in that case. And so you know there's a little less variability with that system. And also tied to this is um, your watershed hydrology, is it ephemeral, perennial, flashy, slow moving storms? Um, these are all just ways to start to think about your project and how you're changing things and how it's going to respond and change. Um, so I'm pretty sure lanes balance is a requirement for any presentation that talks about stream mechanics. And so again, um, we've all probably seen this, it just highlights the different responses. With a coarse bed system, you have a flat slope, you're going to be in degradation, right? Fine bed system, steep slope, you're going to be uh, in an erosive state. And so trying to reach this balance is, is a lot of what you're doing in these systems. So how do culverts necessarily affect your stream geomorphology or, or what's going on in your system? Um, and so this is kind of what I had mentioned at the top is a lot of times these undersized culverts can end up acting like dams. And just to, this great graphic from HDS5 actually shows that same occurrence. And so when you have this undersized culvert, right, it acts as a dam and so you get flow attenuation and you get changes to your upstream or downstream ecology based on how it's changing the flow regime. And so say you're going to go in and replace something like this. This is probably an undesirable condition. 
we need to think, okay, if we, if we replace this, are we suddenly going to see incising upstream? Are we going to damage or hurt the upstream or downstream ecology in the system? If, if that's a concern for your setting, um, particularly the Pacific Northwest, I know that's um, you know, a big concern is thinking about fish passage and other things, or even you know, wetland impacts or good vegetation, you're going to change that. Um, and then the effects of these flows not being attenuated downstream, what's that going to do to the downstream infrastructure? And so this right here, if I can figure out how to play the video, shows a example of stream response over time. Here we go, sorry about that. So you'll see over time, it's a single threaded channel, it's incised, um, but they come in here and put an access road. And so as, as time goes on and and that stream system changes and this access road is established, adjacent development occurs, you'll see changes around here. There's an upstream kind of wetlands ponded area that forms as a result of the response of the system um, due to these human-induced changes. So we'll show it one more time here. So this is the type of thing that, that occurred over time, and so maybe your project is, is going in and you're actually going to you know, right-size a culvert that's going to um, cross this drainage. And so you have to think, okay, previously before this access road, small culvert dam scenario was here, um, we were getting an incising channel, um, some erosion, and now we've had some increased vegetation, and, and maybe this area here is ponding. And so if you change that, how are you going to affect that development? Are you going to get incising? Uh, what about this property down here? All things to start thinking about. So, you know, another aspect of this is uh, culverts providing grade control. So in a scenario where you may want to remove a culvert for fish passage, you may want to um, increase the size, create like an open bottom arch, um, have you now opened up the possibility of a head cut moving up your system through your culvert or even affecting your culvert? Um, what's going on? So um, here again is kind of that classic example of a small culvert um, embankment flat slope, so depositional zone that's formed due to this. And so if you go ahead and open this up, you know, this backwater is going to change and there's potentials for these stream responses. So what are those going to be? Um, so you need to determine a mitigation strategy to start thinking about what's going to happen. Um, so we've talked about stream stability as a concern, but also peak flow and flood volume as a concern. So you have that flood volume attenuated by this undersized culvert. Um, what's going to happen when you open that up? Can the downstream infrastructure handle it? Um, peak flow, peak velocity, change in hydrograph. Um, are we going to start changing the stream mechanics in the system? So I actually um, kind of dawned on me when looking um, in the stream restoration guidebook for another project that this is almost the inversed problem of urbanization where our actual proposed condition is we have attenuated flood volume due to these infrastructure changes in your system. So if you change that, you're going to more likely get a hydrograph or a response that has occurred due to urbanization. Um, in your system. So again, we're working with this twofold problem of you know volume, flood volume, and then also sediment transport in your system or the stream responses. So just to go through maybe some simplified procedures where you can you can look at your your project and get you know a quick idea in terms of what the impacts are going to be. Are they significant? Um, 
do we have to go to a more advanced analysis? How do we mitigate this? So a lot of times in projects, um, right, culvert hydraulics, maybe in an ephemeral system is computed with a steady flow. Um, maybe HY8, HEC RAS, some of these different tools. And so one simplified approach that, that we've used before is simply looking at your water surface elevation upstream um, in a certain flow event for existing and proposed conditions. And then um, based on your peak flow rate, assume that's constant um, throughout that time. And so you can actually get a, a differential time for that volume in the flood hydrograph. And so depending on your case, you know, six, a six and a half minute difference may be significant and may be not. And then are you looking at a two hour storm, a six hour storm, a 24 hour storm? You know, if you don't have um, hydrographs, you just have steady flow, this gives you just a quick rough idea to say, we should probably look at this further or, you know, we're comfortable with the risk. We don't think um, changes to that attenuation are going to significantly affect downstream properties. So then when we start to look at um, stream stability as a problem, um, the HEC RAS hydraulic design has a number of great tools that you can use to, to assess your system. So I'm sure we're all probably familiar with this. I'm not breaking new ground here. There's uh, you know the stable channel design function. So using Copeland's method uh, in a sand bed system, we can look at a stability curve of slope versus width of maybe our low flow channel that we're designing to tie into um, adjacent grade for part of this culvert improvement project, right? And so then we can say, okay, we're expecting aggradation, we're expecting degradation um, as part of these parameters. And so then you can start to modify your design to get more in the stable range. Um, and again, this is based on a uh, supply, sediment supply reach upstream of your project. Uh, another method is just looking at the relative difference of sediment transport capacity. And so really in this case, without more data, without calibration, whatever, you're going to look at the relative change of your system and, and see how it may be changing between existing and proposed conditions. So um, if you look through your, your, maybe your open bottom culvert, your upstream channel, in existing conditions, there's a certain sediment transport capacity potential in that system. And then in proposed, have you reduced it? Have you increased it? If you reduce it, you're going to expect um, erosion. If you increase, or no, that's the other way around, sorry. Um, so how you affect um, the changes in potential sediment transport capacity are going to affect your project. Again, another tool to think about. Um, the SIAM tool also embedded in HEC RAS. So this is a good sediment budget tool um, to compare an annual, annualized sediment um, reach transport capacities. So you can um, kind of create these flow duration um, hydrology based on a certain time frame and look at the overall system. And so what this is going to tell you is, um, you know, a surplus or an excess in, in your sediment budget. And again, this is, these are just good screening level tools where you can look at relative differences of your system, how your project is changing it uh, to understand the impacts. So again, looping back to the beginning, thinking about level of design considerations. Um, and so I think, at least for me, um, you know, or this isn't, these aren't always things that you think about um, maybe for a culvert replacement and ephemeral drainage. So how responsive is your system likely to be? Is critical infrastructure going to be affected? What are the ecological impacts? What are you changing to the system? Um, helping, hurting conditions? What's the project criteria? These are, these are all things to think about, you know, when you're scoping your project, when you're developing project goals is, is what's the risk? And, and how are we going to respond to that? So again, some of those simplified tools are relative differences good enough for design? Or do we need to go to a full sediment transport model in maybe a very ephemeral, flashy sand bed system 
where uh, the response is the adjacent infrastructure, the risk is, is high, and so you need a higher level of analysis. Or are you looking at replacing a 24-inch CMP highway crossing uh, that drains the ditch? So there's different level of design considerations um, based on your setting and your system. Um, you know, this is a coarse bed system, uh, regime channel. You don't have the same considerations you would um, on a sand bed system. So again, um, I had to show a picture of my budding water resources engineer here looking at a uh, threshold channel, Zapata Falls, right? So that's an area where there's probably a low um, response potential. Then on the left here, um, this video I, I think is really cool because you can actually see the, the bed load and the suspended load, unless it's super blurry, um, going down the sand bed system. And this actually fed to a concrete apron and I could, you could hear the pebbles, the small gravels pinging off of that um, concrete apron. So there's an example of a high response potential, a low response potential. So to loop back to the very beginning, why bigger is not always better, well, that's kind of wrong. Bigger is usually better for culvert hydraulics, right? We want to pass flood flows. We want to um, promote fish passage. Uh, we want safe infrastructure, right? But if we're looking at this in terms of headwater over depth, are we meeting a FEMA no rise? There's, there's chances where we may miss some of these other components that are going to affect your design. And so if you go in and say, our headwater depth is at three. This is unacceptable. Let's put in something that gets us at a 0 0.8, a 1.2 new culvert. Next thing you know, your upstream channel is incising. And that's not a condition you may want for your project. So these are things to start to think about and be cognizant of. Um, you know, be wary of the flood volume impacts. Um, Simplified analysis, if you have hydrographs and you're running unsteady flow, 2D flow, you're going to be able to tell um, the differences and know how it's impacting things. Um, so really, this is probably stuff everyone knows, but um, you know, I know I forget it sometimes, and it's good to keep it in your mind when doing designs and thinking about things like culvert hydraulics is that it may be more complex than you initially think. So you need to start. Um, so it's important for us to think about some of these potentials um, and how they affect your design. So that, any questions? I'll bring the, I'll bring the mic around. Good morning. When you're talking about looking at the downstream impacts, there is the rerouting method in HECRAS versus doing like a, a, a pond, um, just a standard routing with like a pond pack. And we're find we found very different results from them. Have you have you had that experience? And what do you recommend? Um, I do not have experience in that tool, so um, not necessarily able to comment on that, but I'd love to talk to you after this and hear more about it. Any other questions? Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, I think that's often something that um, we overlook our impacts to, to the stream when we're putting bridges or culverts. I guess uh, my question to you is um, often here in Ohio when we if we were to put a larger culvert in that was there before, downstream property owners get a little skittish about that. And sometimes they approach us and say, hey, now you're putting more water on us. Have you experienced that and how do you handle it? So it, I guess it depends on where you're working and, and you know, what state, what, what the rules are. Um, where we've used that kind of simplified flood volume impact was in New York. And, there, you know, the downstream property owners were worried about that. And so we had to address that in some way. Um, I'm from Colorado, and, and I haven't really run into that um, there in the state. It's, you know, it's something I usually think about as a designer, but um, 
in my experience, and you know, it's it's limited, is that um, I haven't seen that as a an issue. But I think, you know, providing some of this reporting and modeling and proof that, you know, what the impact is is really kind of where you need to go to to satisfy those homeowners or landowners. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Thank you.